The Sinai and Palestine campaign of World War I was fought between the British Empire and the Ottoman Empire, who were supported by the Germans. In January 1915, the Ottoman Empire invaded the Sinai Peninsula, but were unsuccessful in trying to raid the Suez Canal. A few months later, the Allies attempted a land invasion on the Turkish peninsula of Gallipoli, which was unsuccessful. The campaign was abandoned. The Egyptian Expeditionary Force was formed in early 1916, and they were tasked with taking control of the Sinai Peninsula. Through a series of battles, they went on to conquer Palestine, Jordan, and southern Syria. Reverend David Williams, who is with the 53rd Welsh Division, is talking about his time uh, after his first real example of battle, writing home to his wife. The serious fighting came last Tuesday. We attacked a series of hills to the north of Beersheba at dawn, under cover of a tremendous artillery barrage. It was my first experience, although I had been under shell fire more than once. I can't tell you how I felt. The only sign I had was to find men falling all around me. Luckily, one had enough to do tending wounded, holding on like grim death. But at night we gained our point. The Turk has been driven back. The battlefield the next day was a sight never to be forgotten. And in the afternoon I was able to bury our own dead. Some of our best had fallen. I am alive. And well, thank God now, as we are behind the line. Our operations have been mainly on the Beersheba side, but the whole Turkish line has broken and has been pushed back. Yesterday was Sunday, and we had a short memorial service. Chaplains were not meant to be writing about military activities, but they often did. And David Williams's letters to his wife, which were censored by him, so they weren't censored at all really, actually do give a very clear picture of the horrendous activities that were happening and the loss of young lives. He's quite concerned about that. And the way that he writes back to his wife um, does show that he cared a great deal for these young men. Um, and he was very concerned that they were given proper Christian burial, and also that they also looked after the fallen enemy as well. And that becomes quite apparent from all the people writing, that they also respected the fallen enemy, and that wherever possible they would immediately bury and uh, look after the remains of the fallen. Reverend D David Thomas Jones, an Anglican who was with the 231st Yeomanry uh, Brigade, he writes, After breakfast we went higher up the wadi to try and find the body of a killed man called Walker, but failed to find it. I came across a dying Turk, but there was nothing I could do for him but breathe a prayer. At the CO's request went to 229 Field Ambulance to arrange the evacuation of wounded and left at dusk. The Palestine campaign represents one or two problems as well as one or two points of interest, particular points of interest, for the British public and for military chaplains. Now obviously when Allenby recaptures Jerusalem in December 1917 he has achieved what Richard the Lionheart failed to do several hundred years before. It's also a major achievement given that this follows a year of disappointment on the Western Front, the Third Battle of Ypres, etc., the failure really of the Cambrai Offensive. All of this, in many respects, is compensated for by the capture of Jerusalem. Now, chaplains are very conscious that they're serving in a biblical landscape. Um, chaplains' accounts of the campaign are full of soldiers observing how this landscape seems familiar 
from their Sunday school lessons, these names, this terminology, etc. So there is a tremendous consciousness of being in a historic and indeed sacred landscape. But at the other hand, on the other hand, chaplains cannot talk up the idea of crusading because, of course, many of the soldiers serving alongside British soldiers in Palestine are themselves Muslim, Indian Muslim soldiers, and of course the Arab revolt, which T. E. Lawrence helps to instigate against Turkish rule, again is a revolt which is undertaken largely by Muslims. So there is certainly a sharpened interest in the Palestine campaign. Um, obviously because Britain is the sort of society that it is, very biblically aware, steeped, as it were, in biblical tradition, biblical knowledge. The First World War in Palestine really does help to underscore that interest and that enthusiasm. But the rhetoric of the war cannot be taken to such heights that it will actually alienate Britain's allies. So there is a softly, softly approach taken in relation to the campaign in Palestine. It's interesting on all sorts of levels, but in certain respects, perceptions of the war cannot be taken in certain directions because they could alienate Britain's allies. With the letters that um, Abram Rees Morgan sends back to his church, it's quite obvious that he and his soldiers are moving across country, not very quickly, but they are moving from one place to the other. And in his correspondence, Morgan relates quite often to the biblical texts in the Old Testament and in the New Testament as to where people were in the biblical stories. They were there where Jesus moved. They were in the area surrounding the, the biblical stories. Whilst he wasn't meant to be telling people back home he, where he was, it seems very odd perhaps today that he was relating to them the exact place where they were at by quoting the verses from the Old Testament or the New Testament as to the places where Jesus or others performed certain things. And people who would look up in their Bibles would actually see that they were on Mount something or other, or that they were at the valley leading to somewhere. So it was pretty obvious that he was actually telling them where they were, although he was meant to keep that secret. And the soldiers, I think, they also tried to cover where they were by saying that they had seen the places where certain miracles had happened or where um, Jesus had walked, particularly after the Battle of Jerusalem, and the soldiers were allowed to wander about, uh, escorted by chaplains and others. Some Navy chaplains serving at sea experienced one of the major naval battles of the war, the Battle of Jutland. On the 31st of May 1916, the Reverend Henry Dixon Wright was aboard HMS Barham, which was part of a flotilla squadron at Jutland. He was severely wounded during the battle and died of his wounds. A badly damaged HMS Barham managed to limp back to Scapa Flow in the Orkneys. There were nine chaplains of the Royal Navy who died at the Battle of Jutland with no known graves. The experience of chaplaincy in the First World War is a very major uh, stimulus to ecumenism. And by ecumenism, I don't simply mean um, official ecumenism, ecumenism by the book, uh, top-down ecumenism. It's a very great solvent, however, to religious prejudice at a grassroots level. Um, there's a very charming book written as the war and published as the war is taking place by a United Methodist minister and said that he is billeted behind the lines with a Catholic priest, an Anglican clergyman, people who he wouldn't have anything to do with in civilian society. And they're thrown together, they work together, they rely on each other, they pass information about their respective flocks to each other. And the situation is remarkably harmonious. You have situations of practical ecumenism, which are beyond counting in the First World War, the sort of situation which you simply would not have in civilian life. And I think it's really remarkable that one of the letters that I discovered um, in the Catholic chaplain's archives at Downside Abbey was written by a Jesuit um, to a senior Catholic chaplain and said, if you see John Morrow uh, Sims, who was a, an Irish Presbyterian and a senior chaplain, please do give him my best regards because it was an honour and a privilege to serve under a man like him. 
And if you think of an Irish Presbyterian and a Jesuit a hundred years ago, having a relationship of such mutual respect and esteem, inconceivable in civilian society, realised in the context of the First World War. Chaplains were quite often described in soldiers' letters. Um, a young man from Anglesey, writing home to his family, mentioned that whilst on the Western Front, he had met a chaplain who was from Caernarvon, not very far away um, from his home, and who had um, conducted uh, Holy Communion for the soldiers involved in whatever it was they were doing. And although he's not from the same tradition as the young man writing home, there's a great deal of respect for the chaplain and what he was trying to do to help them. And I think that it was obvious during the war that the denominational divides had crumbled and the chaplains were making a huge effort to extend out to everybody um, the hand of God um, and that there wasn't the problems that perhaps one was faced back home where there was still an element of uh, that that's the place that you don't go to church and that's the place you do. Um, but it was, it was apparent that there was a, a great deal of ecumenical work being conducted by the chaplains of all denominations. And that, I think, did help the soldiers. Because many of the soldiers didn't understand the denominational aspect of where they'd come from. But they certainly understood what the chaplain was trying to do to help them in war. Owen Watkins serves as the senior uh, Wesleyan chaplain in France until towards the end of the war when British troops are moved to Italy. He becomes the principal chaplain responsible for all chaplaincy services in Italy. Uh, and one of his tasks is to recruit local Catholic priests in Italy to provide for the spiritual needs of small groups of Catholic soldiers who are spread all around Italy. Uh, interestingly, it gets to the ears of the Pope that uh, a, a Protestant chaplain is employing Catholic priests um, and a meeting is arranged and Pope Benedict is reported to have said that it was a beautiful thing that he was doing uh, and it would be reviewed again at the end of the war. Army Chaplain's War Memorial is in the Royal Garrison Church of All Saints in Aldershot. Um, it forms a series of panels at the eastern end of the church and they are listed alphabetically with no indication either of their denomination or when they died or how they died. And there are 172 names there. Some of those weren't actually serving when they died and a number of them died of disease in this country. And that one of the things that started me on my um, sort of academic interest in chaplaincy of World War I was to try and work out how many chaplains had actually died. And it's impossible. What we can be more sure is the, uh, the numbers who, who were killed at the front. 96 chaplains um, died as a direct result of enemy action. Um, they're mostly split between those who were killed in the front line by uh, small arms fire or machine gun fire um, and those who died as a result of shelling um, and they could have been anywhere. I mean there's a story of a, a Catholic chaplain who's walking down a road about to visit a, a, a gun battery and a shell burst uh, goes off where he happens to be and he's killed. Uh, we know of a number of chaplains who were in ambulances, either collecting wounded or taking them to uh, casualty clearing station behind the lines and again shell fire um, and they die as a result of it. The role of the chaplain and the expectations of his ministry does differ obviously according to the tradition which he's from. Um, for me, one of the outstanding chaplains would be uh, Julian Bickersteth of the 56th London Division, who came from a very privileged clerical family, came back from Australia to join the Army Chaplains Department in 1915, um, served at the Somme, served uh, throughout the battles of 1917 and on through the, throughout the war. And his correspondence with his mother illustrates that this is a very sensitive, very robust and very courageous individual who is fully aware of the, the horrors of the war, the uh, 
the demands that are placed on soldiers, the demands that are placed on fellow chaplains, and rises to the challenge with a great deal of faith, a great deal of good humour and a great deal of um, humility. He is a remarkable character. Um, the thing is, is there are far more Julian Bickerstats than um, perhaps we are aware, and they existed in all traditions. William Evans Jones, the young man who felt the need to volunteer to be a soldier on the outbreak of the war, who was wounded and sent home and his discharge paper says no longer fit for military duty. But he insisted that he went to go back to be a chaplain. And he was allowed to do that. And I think that his example of a young man committed to Christ, who felt the need to be there with and for the soldiers, it really gives a, an excellent example of how many of those chaplains felt they were there to secure the spiritual aspect of the soldiers to make sure that they were safe. Having been a soldier himself, he knew the dangers. He had been in battle. He knew what they needed and he was there for them. And perhaps misguidedly, he accompanied one of the advanced companies of his battalion during an attack at villiers uh, in France in October of 1918 and he was killed he was there to help those who were wounded and he felt that it was his place to be with his soldiers. And I think that really, uh, from the Gospel of John, there is no greater love. And on his tombstone, that's the little epitaph in Welsh, there is no greater love than a man gives his life for his friends. The overwhelming evidence anecdotal for the First World War, but um, capable of being subst substantiated with statistics during the second, particularly in another national context, indicates that soldiers find great support and comfort from religion. That um, protest atheism is a very rare phenomenon indeed. Um, there's a very revealing account written by a YMCA worker in a YMCA hut. Um, from the latter months of the war when two Canadian soldiers stand up in the hut and say that they had lost their faith in the front line and a British soldier stands up and said that I had found my faith in the front line and this soldier is applauded by those soldiers in the gathering. That the, the weight of evidence seems to be that um, reliance on God which can be quite sophisticated, it might be quite crude, according to religious observers, clergy, etc., is a very, very strong coping mechanism, very widespread coping mechanism in the British Army at this time. The idea that soldiers reject God as a result of the experience of the war is, is, is a hackneyed cliche. There is very, very little evidence of that. The evidence seems to point very strongly in the other direction. Many historians would point to the singing of, of rude songs, for instance, and, and saying rude poems and, uh, and that kind of thing, and that was all true. But equally true was soldiers were also happy to sing hymns. And there's one story of a YMCA worker looking out on a group of soldiers in the pouring rain going towards the train. And they were singing quietly and to themselves without anyone encouraging them to do so, kindly light lead me on. So they knew their hymns. They knew the hymns really, really well. And one commentator during, writing during the First World War said that soldiers often used to quote hymn numbers to each other uh, so that they would know what the first line was and therefore feel encouraged uh, and this kind of thing. So religion and you know, their Christian faith, whether culturally or personal, was very vibrant during this period of the First World War. In the battlefields of the Western Front, a plant grew in the midst of the chaos, the bright red Flanders poppy. In 1915, Canadian Lieutenant Colonel John McRae, after seeing the bloody conflict of Ypres, wrote the famous poem In Flanders Fields. Here's an extract of the first stanza. In Flanders Fields the poppies blow between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place and in the sky the larks, still bravely singing, 
fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. An American YWCA worker, Miss Moyna Michael, read it and wrote her own poem in reply to McCrae's called We Shall Keep the Faith. Here's an extract from the last stanza. And now the torch and poppy red we wear in honour of our dead. Fear not that you have died for naught. We'll teach the lesson that ye wrought in Flanders Fields. At the YWCA War Secretaries Conference in 1918, she wore a poppy and gave some to the delegates. From then on, she wore a red poppy as a symbol of remembrance. Miss Michael campaigned to have the poppy adopted as a national symbol of remembrance. In 1920, the National American Legion adopted it as their official symbol of remembrance. The first poppy appeal took place in 1921 by the Royal British Legion. The poppy has become the symbol of remembrance for those who gave their lives. It's very interesting to note that some of the most iconic symbols of remembrance um, were very much influenced by chaplains and in no situation is this influence most clearly felt and in the case of the unknown warrior who was interred in Westminster Abbey in uh, 1919. The idea for this was essentially born of a chaplain's reflections on the number of unknown bodies who were actually um, buried in France and indeed elsewhere and the idea of the unknown warrior, a soldier being brought back, given a place among kings, honoured by the public, by the empire at large as it were, given the sort of treatment which would only be accorded to the nation's greatest heroes. This is very much emblematic of one chaplain's experiences of the tremendous courage and resilience of um, British soldiers in this period and the desire that those who were buried without an identity, for want of a better expression, uh, would be honoured in a manner that was appropriate. And it really does give one an insight into the empathy and the compassion and the sense of solidarity which chaplains felt towards the men to whom they ministered. <laughs>